Washington, D.C. to take back the White House? Read my lips. No new taxes. We see Russia from land here in Alaska. To a number of women's groups and said, can you help us find folks? And they brought us whole binders full of, uh, of women. Work begins anew. The hope rises again. And the dream lives on. Welcome back to The Race. Thank you for joining us. This is going to be episode four, or maybe episode two of our sort of two-part. Two part, part, part two. Part episode, two. All right. Part two. Three. Part two of episode three, or episode four, <laughs> however you want to look at it. Uh, if you haven't had a chance yet to listen to any of our other podcasts, feel free to check them out. Episode one, two, and three are already posted. You can find it on our website. You can find it on Facebook, iTunes, Google Music. Spotify, any or all, um, feel free to check them out. And if you haven't listened to episode three, which kind of starts off this one, um, I guess you don't have to listen to episode three. No, you no. can listen to episode four and then go back to three. They kind of go together. Uh, they both take place in 1946. Uh, we spent our last episode discussing the 12th congressional district in California. And today we're going to be discussing the 11th, Congress, no, 11th congressional district in Massachusetts, uh, which will be the election of JFK. Hi, everyone. This is Jim oh, Blaster. Sorry. I didn't do any introductions uh, with my co-host Gary Mannion here. Now I get to introduce you. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Uh, we really do appreciate it. We really uh, enjoyed these last couple podcasts, and we're going to keep going. So, um, As Gary said, this is uh, about JFK's first congressional election at the age of 29 in the Massachusetts 11th Congressional District, which is centered around Boston. Um, uh, specifically South Boston being the big area uh, for him to try to pull from when he runs, being uh, Irish Catholic himself and a huge Irish Catholic population in Boston at the time. Uh, so really, I guess the background we have to talk about is how this seat came into play. Um, and when JFK uh, is serving overseas, um, he is in the Navy. He had just graduated from Harvard, uh, goes in to serve in the Navy in the Asian theater, uh, and he actually is wounded, receives Purple Heart, um, and comes home not expecting to have to run for Congress at all. Actually, is planning on becoming a journalist. Um, but uh, Joseph Kennedy has a very, very different plan for him when he gets home. Um, so first off, if you hear any noise in the background, I apologize. My dog is pretty active right now. Um, he's usually pretty quiet during the podcast, but, but not so much right now. Uh, so as Jim said, JFK, he, he definitely was not a sort of – this was not his destiny in his mind, I guess, is, is the way you could say it. Uh, but – Unfortunately for for Jack, his older brother Joe, uh, older brother Joe, Joe who Jr. was the eldest son of um, Joe Kennedy, was pegged. This was his um, sort of path that he was going to take. This was where he was going. Uh, unfortunately, he was killed in action during World War II. Jack, being the second oldest, uh, was expected to take the reins after that. So he does come back, sort of thrown into this. Um, any documentary you read or any – I'm sorry, any documentary you watch or anything you typically read, it typically sounds like Jack comes home from war and he goes gallivanting about and sort of becomes the womanizer that we know him to be. Uh, that's actually not even how it happened. He, he actually was still overseas after his PT Cruiser went down. And PT Cruiser? Wasn't that a PT boat? <laughs> That's a car. That's a car. <laughs> PT boat. Sorry, his PT yeah. boat. <laughs> uh, it's been a long day. We usually shoot these. We usually do these in the morning. It's later in the day now. Um, yeah, his PT boat. Sorry, <laughs> his PT cruiser. His PT boat uh, gets shot down. So cut in half. Cut so in half. Right. You're not shot down. Sorry, cut in half. Yeah. Uh, shot at, I guess. Yeah. And so uh, by the time he comes home, his dad has pretty much already started his campaign. Remember now that. Growing up, Jack lived mostly they, – they were from Massachusetts, um, but he lived in New York. Um, he lived 
out of the state of Massachusetts mostly. They, they lived over in Europe for a long time. Yep. Joe Sr. was the ambassador. Um, so he did a lot of his living not in this district really. Actually, he never really lived in the district. Um, I believe Joe Sr. was originally from Southie. Mm -hmm. So he, he was from the general area of Boston, uh, which consists of this district, which this district no longer exists in the state of Massachusetts, the 11th district. But um, it definitely carpet bagging as, as we say <laughs> a, i guess sort of the definition of it they definitely they they kind of pushed in so what happens is is joe joe senior kind of shows up while jack is still serving overseas and starts getting the kennedy name out there in this district starts writing out checks um writes a six hundred thousand dollar check to the archdiocese of boston writes a a number of philanth uh, phil, um, philanthropic. philanthropic type of checks to different organizations in the district to start getting them out there and when jack comes home he's sort of thrown into this and is sort of sent around to campaign um he hires a pr firm actually right off the bat joe senior and tells them to book jfk at every event that needs a free speaker in the district and so he goes around and he starts telling his stories of, of at war his post your his post-war europe stories you know uh, his stories of the PT boat, uh, and that's basically how how he gets his start in the district. But again, the congressional seat really wasn't open. No, it, no. It, it does become open, but it wasn't open to begin with. So, in fact, um, this this was this congressional seat was held by then former mayor, uh, former governor, and current congressman. James Michael Curley, the one and only, uh, if I might say. Um, <clears throat> this is a man who I, I would say is legendary in Irish American history, circles. as it, it was yeah. circles, as it were, especially in South Boston at the time. Um, this is the Irish mayor. Um, and so he's serving as congressman. And you don't just unseat a very popular sitting congressman. In fact, uh, something else happens that that helps persuade uh, Congressman Curley at the time to run for mayor again in 1945 when JFK uh, was still actually in the Navy. Um, there was an indictment that came down, uh, in fact, of Mayor Curley, uh, which he would later serve his time while mayor uh, in the 19, in 1946, um, he went uh, and had a conversation with uh, Joe Sr. And they pretty much said to him, as well as Honey Fitz, who was uh, JFK's future father-in-law, um, they had a conversation and said, listen, Mr. Curley, uh, you can either keep serving as congressman and be removed from Congress, most likely. They being they they being uh, Joe and Joe and and Jack's father in law, future father, future father in law. Uh, yeah, so they they went and said to Mr. Curley, "Listen, um, you're gonna get indicted. Uh, you're gonna go to jail, but if you're mayor, you won't be removed from office. If you're congressman, you will. So maybe you should run for mayor." Um, and, uh, the astute, uh, Mr. Curley decided it was his, in his best interest. And also this ends up being the last political office he serves in, um, uh, decides to, uh, give up his congressional career and run for mayor of Boston for his, uh, one, two, three, fourth term as mayor of Boston. So. Uh, I'll let Gary take it from there. So Kennedy comes back now from from war and, and he's campaigning. Uh, not the JFK we know, no. right? Not not the JFK that we know today. That you know, you've seen the pictures of, you've seen the the clips of uh, Camelot. Camelot, the the well refined speaker, attractive, tan, um, just a well polished, well maintained person. Not what you get. You get a 29-year-old, uh, as Jim said, just post-war. Um, he 
didn't he wasn't used to giving speeches like he, he wasn't a, he wasn't a speaker yet he wasn't a great orator not one of the greatest um but he, he didn't have that knack for him at first so he starts uh giving these speeches he's going around to all these um organizations give, you know giving talks talking about his uh experiences over in europe but it, it becomes clear that it's, if you listen to our previous podcast not to give anything away um but richard nixon takes this campaign himself by pretty much being that charismatic charismatic young. yeah that's the way. <laughs> that young charismatic guy who can energetic. speak to a crowd who's energized who's good to go he he he's squared away and he can he can get a crowd going he can do whatever he needs he's just gonna get him in front of people which is how he he really really his campaign style gets him it becomes clear that that's not gonna work in boston in 1946 that being said, however, I mean, JFK was a relentless campaigner. He did everything. Yeah. He went everywhere. He went to the docks and he would shake everyone's hand and went into work. He would go to neighborhoods and shake people's hands. He would go to uh, social gatherings and meet everyone. It was just that he was a young, awkward man at the time. He was afraid to introduce himself. Um, he always worked off of a script. Uh, in fact, there was a story about uh, his sister Eunice having to sit in the front row of one of his speeches, and she had to essentially mouth the words to him uh, so he could get through the speech. It was so. This was this was not uh, the clean, polished presidential candidate and president that we have all learned about. This was a young, twenty-nine-year-old awkward lanky sick actually uh congressional candidate uh, coming on the heels of the famous james michael curley who's legendary in massachusetts and especially in boston at the time um this is uh quite a different jfk that we've come to know and love uh, but he does have one thing that richard nixon didn't have when he ran um he has a lot of money like a lot of money you have the former ambassador uh of the united kingdom his father joe kennedy um who bankrolls this entire campaign they do fundraise uh his mother and sisters do house parties and fundraising but the bulk of this money comes from the family's uh fortune as it was so that was really what paid for the advertising the signs the the really anything that you need on a campaign in 1946. So there's another aspect to this that when Kennedy first comes back, um, I completely forgot about, uh, not to jump too quickly, far, or not to go backwards too far, uh, but when Kennedy comes back, it's clear to Joe Sr. that he's, his son's going to run for office. Congress was not his first choice. Um, Joe Sr. wanted to put Joe, a Jack, into the lieutenant governor's race, actually. He was going to run as a lieutenant governor uh, with Maurice Tobin, who was the governor at the time, uh, and he was going to be the Democratic candidate. Unfortunately, um, in Massachusetts in 1946, or in the 40s, things were done a little bit differently in the sense that uh, if you ran for lieutenant governor, uh, you didn't necessarily run on as like a ticket. Mm -hmm. So in theory, a Republican governor could have been elected, and, and Jack would have still could have been the, the lieutenant governor or vice versa or vice versa right so it so instead of throwing him into a partisan battle right off the bat uh, they eventually chose congress although jfk wanted congress the entire time um as well as his uh grandfather honey Fitz. Mm -hmm. they were two yeah. of them step father-in-law father-in-law <laughs> father um had him going um wanted him to run for congress uh joe actually wanted him to run lieutenant governor but so they get this going and all this money they're now generating or not say generating all this money that the family is now putting up uh for for jack to be able to do this uh they get creative i guess will be the word with with how they use it um a lot of these tactics i won't say they're used today but they go through some pretty Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> I, I was going to say some pretty 
underhanded. Not underhanding, <laughs> some very drastic, I'll say, yeah. some very <laughs> drastic measures um, to get get them elected. And so one of the first things they do, not one of the first things, but one of the things they do is, well, they they want to clear the field, we'll say, right? They want to get all of the challengers out of the race because one way to win the primary would just to walk in and, and not be challenged. But it's clear he's going to be challenged. So they actually offer uh, several candidates jobs in the Kennedy administration. Or no, sorry, not in the Kennedy administration. In the Kennedy Foundation. Yeah. Um, leave now. Don't run for office. $25,000 a year for the rest of your life. Uh, a lot of them don't budge. A lot of them don't take it. And... Uh, it becomes very clear that this is actually going to be a battle and they're going to have to fight it. Very crowded field. Very crowded field. So one of the first um, – I have it right here. One of the first attacks on the Kennedys, as you can imagine, as they are carpetbaggers, comes from uh, one of their candidates. Uh, last name is Russo, which we'll, we'll get more into Russo in a little bit. But one of Russo's uh, newspaper ads that he put out, it said this. It said, Congress seat for sale. No experience necessary. Applicant must live in New York or Florida. Only millionaires need apply. Uh, so it became very clear to the candidates, at least, the bow, yeah. uh, how this was going to go. And they took to the attack right away. And, of course, the Kennedys didn't like that. Um, so Joe, being the genius Joe Sr., being the genius campaigner that he is, uh, gets creative mm -hmm. with how to get back at Russo. Um, and they actually find another – I believe it's Joe Russo, Joseph Joe, Russo. Yeah. Um, they find another Joseph Russo, and they say, hey, Joe Russo, you're not running for Congress, but we'll give you a couple thousand dollars, and now you are running for Congress. Joe, just put your name just on the ballot. Just put your name on the ballot, and that's what they actually do. They actually get they get another Joe Russo to run, mm -hmm. and they, no, you know, no, nothing said. You know, Nobody – they don't make this public. They don't make it known. Just as the deadline's coming up to file for nominations – his name is on the ballot, and that's an unfortunate thing for the real Joe Russo. So the the actually it was in Politico.com as we're researching this. It's like the top sixteen most dirty tricks in like American politics or something like that. And this was listed like you open it up, and this is literally the first one that popped up. So I don't know if it was sixteen or first, but uh, I mean, talk about a, a way to mess with the system, as it were. Uh, Joe Russo versus nine other candidates, and by the way, that one of them is also called Joe Russo. So there's no question about that. They they did this intentionally uh, against him and intentionally to to help dilute his vote. Uh, in the end, it actually doesn't matter. Joe Russo comes in third, and his uh, second name, as it were, Joe Russo only gets about 1% or 2% of the vote. So it doesn't actually affect the outcome. But I think it's this was the long game. This was if Joe Russo was going to be the guy who we're going to have to run against, uh, that we're going to make sure we mess with him as much as we can, mm -hmm. as it were. So now you have 10 congressional candidates running for an open congressional seat in South Boston. There's 10. Ten candidates. Yeah. Only five on the on the ballot. Oh, okay. I I had read ten. That was what I had read. Maybe ten had announced. Oh, maybe ten had announced. That's yeah, what it was. So yeah. Only five went through with it. Ended up pulling the trigger, as it were. So, uh, you have who? Oh, no pun intended. There. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of lot of people running for this race, regardless. Uh, even before the deadline. Uh, and uh, so, you have this twenty-nine-year-old who's nervous, awkward mechanic, as it's even described by some uh, documentarians, going up against these uh, longtime players in, in South Boston and in Massachusetts for an open congressional seat. So this is a race. Uh, and like I said, JFK works day and night um, from sunup to sundown, campaigning um, every single day. And it... It takes a toll because this is not, unfortunately, this is not a well man. Um, he goes into Congress uh, in '46 and is actually diagnosed with um, Addison's disease, um, and he 
he's had he's had chronic back problems ever since the uh, his PT boat was split in half, um, which plagued him for the rest of his life. He's heavily medicated throughout this campaign uh, by instruction of his father. In fact, uh, to keep him going was the direct quote from his father. Um, so it was uh, quite a different. Like I said, different JFK, different not known person that we have come to idolize and and mysticize almost as as a presidential candidate. Uh, so part of the I guess the the, the upside to um, having a lot of connections in Boston at that point in time is. Uh, Early on in the camp, well, not early on, but but right around the time of the filing deadline, uh, the the campaign actually runs into runs into an issue. Uh, so, campaign signatures to get your name on the ballot were due at the at the elections office in the state house on April twenty third by five o'clock. So, Kennedy headquarters is campaigning all day. It's April twenty third. Um, and they look up and it's 6.30 p.m. And the state house had closed an hour and a half before. Uh, instead of just admitting defeat in that moment, Kennedy wasn't going to take no. So Jack himself actually calls in a few favors and the doors to the state house magically open up. And he's able to get into the state house and drop the papers off in the office. Um, a in, couple time. Of, uh, in time. In time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's weird how it, it, it just in the nick of time. Uh, nobody really knew about that at that point in time. Yeah, so his candidate, his campaign, his opponents were already upset with him about the whole carpet bagging issue. Uh, they were even, if they had known this, they would have been much more upset. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's actually a story of um, one of his opponents uh, by the name of Mike Neville. Uh, Mike Neville was actually seen as probably his main opponent yep. uh, at that point in time. Uh, he was, he was one of the ones that they actually they bribed, pretty heavily. Tried uh, to bribe. tried to bribe several times, uh, and there were several attempts to get him to be taken off of the ballot. Once he refused to bribe, uh, they tried several times to get him to do other things. Uh, they they called in favors from from politicians in the city, business owners in the city. Uh, they couldn't get this Neville off of the ballot, so. Uh, typical Jack or Joe fashion. Um, they pulled out all the stops uh, to get that to be done. Well, one thing that they do, knowing that they're going to have this race now and they're not going to really get people out, is that right after the PT boat had crashed, uh, the Reader's Digest does an article on on JFK and, and on what happened to him over in Europe, how he saved his crew. I'm not Europe, I'm sorry. What happened to him over in Asia. Uh, what happened to his crew, how he saved his crew, swimming to, to save them, the whole writing on the coconut thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so the Reader's Digest does this story. So the Kennedys, taking all the money that they have, they, they take sort of a, a bootlegged copy of the Reader's Digest with this story on it. And they have it first class mailed to every home in the district. Every voter in the district got a copy of this Reader's Digest article. Before he's even back. This, yeah, this was, this was really early on in the campaign. Just a, another indication that once they realized they were going to have a race, they they did the best they could uh, to put him in, in the best spot he could uh, could be mm -hmm. with all the money that they were willing to spend on it. So now you have this relentless young JFK campaigning every single day. Um, so much so, uh, as the story goes... It's Bunker Hill Day, or the Bunker Hill Parade, rather, day before the primary election. Um, and uh, JFK collapses mid-parade. Uh, a lot of the campaign workers at the time assumed he was having a heart attack. This is a 29-year-old. Um, and his father, this is where the quote, quote, quote comes from, is, um, get him ready for tomorrow. Uh, keep him going. Um, th they medicated him, um, and he goes into election day after collapsing the day before, um, and and almost walks away with it, as it were. 
uh, JFK gets 40% of the vote um, when it comes down to the end of the election. His next closest opponent um, is at 20%. So there is uh, no question about who won this campaign when it comes to the numbers. Um, it's not like it was 50-50 or 51-49 or something like that. This is a large race with multiple people in it, um, and he almost walks away with 50% of the vote by himself. Um, the 29-year-old uh, young naval officer uh, hero, as his uh, family would describe, um, really puts this family on the map uh, when it comes to electoral politics in the United States. So as the election is getting closer now and it's it's coming down to the, to the end there, um, there's a there's a funny story with uh, Tip O'Neill, <laughs> or then an assemblyman. Um, so we're state representative. He was an assembly. We didn't have an assembly. We had a state house house of representatives. Let's see, it says assemblyman Tom O'Neill. Um, basically, they are not impressed with the whole Kennedy situation uh he was an he was a, a uh supporter of neville and what ended up happening they ended up coining this no pun intended afterwards is that the kennedy campaign was going to large families in the district mm -hmm. and they would pay large families 50 bucks to make sure all of their family members Every get out and vote. they're essentially buying votes uh if you agreed to have kennedy or jack in your house to meet some of your friends they would bring in a case of booze. They'd bring in a caterer, and they'd give you a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. They were they were essentially buying votes as we know it. So what Tip O'Neill? Ten. Ten. Um, yeah. Yeah. So just so you know, I uh, I pulled up the election history for Gary. There were ten candidates uh, who ran. His his book was inaccurate, as it were, but according to Massachusetts election results, ten candidates. Just All right. Just well, FYI. All right. I'll, call, I'll call Chris Matthews and let him know <laughs> Please. That, yeah, that his book's slightly inaccurate. Um, which, if you haven't read it yet, Chris Matthews' books, Kennedy and Nixon, uh, well Great worth book. a read. Yep. Uh, but so anyways, uh, they're buying these votes. And so the Neville camp, uh, they actually come up with this fantastic idea. They didn't really credit Tip O'Neill with it, but the, the team, basically what they started doing was they, were, they found $20 bills and they were – taking $20 pills and sticking them to their jackets with safety pins. And they were calling them Kennedy buttons. Like Kennedy <laughs> lapel buttons. Like, oh, what's that? And you have a $20 bill. Oh, it's a Kennedy button. Because it's literally just giving away money to get votes yeah. in the end. Kennedy buttons. Yeah. yeah. So, um, like I said, it, the uh, end result of this, JFK walks away with 40% of the vote. This is probably the most heavily Democratic district in the state of Massachusetts at the time, uh, which for a long time, I mean, since the Civil War, was a Republican state. They, they always voted for Republican uh, presidential candidates. They always voted for uh, – usually – started for, a little bit before that. Yeah, 30s. Before. Yeah. 30s really – I the, mean, the, obviously – Most people, yeah, the 30s. The Great Depression yeah. really, really kicked off everything. For Democratic voters, but like California, they went Democrat, mm -hmm. but then went to the Republican. That never really happened. Yeah, with Massachusetts. Yeah, so I mean, for a long time, we always had uh, Republican senators and things like that. So, but this was absolutely. I mean, the, the Irish uh, Americans controlled this congressional seat, as it were, um, and it was Boston was an Irish town at the time, very heavily an Irish town. Um, and it was their influence and their electoral style and just the, the, the relentless campaigning by JFK himself um, that really pushed this campaign to where it was. And, um, I mean, you want to talk about an uneventful uh, general election. I mean, Nixon, we talked about having um, no real primary at all. Uh, and then it comes down to uh, JFK having the primary. And then the general election was a bit of a wash in the sense of um, really he ends up taking 
71% of the vote against the Republican. I mean, Lester uh, Bowen, who I had no shot. I mean, this this was it's not like there was like a scandal to come out of JFK happened yet. It was his this young 29 year old war hero, uh, straight back from the Pacific Front, um, who goes on to become a very young, if not one of the youngest. Uh, in this actually newly controlled Republican Congress, um, the the this is the first time that, uh, like I said in Nixon podcast, this Congress goes Republican, um, very heavily. In fact, one of the largest uh, majorities for Republicans in the 20th century. Um, and JFK comes in a freshman in the minority, uh, really with no political thought in his head prior to his dad saying you're running for office when he comes back uh, because it was always going to be Joe Jr. And really, uh, I, I think that talking about someone coming into their own uh, out of out of this real uh, uh, non-existent uh, election prior to prior to him coming back from World War II. It's also good to know. Uh, it's estimated that Kennedy spent somewhere between and this is 1946 mm. between 250 and 300 thousand dollars on the race, which is exactly six times the amount that Tip O'Neill would spend six years later trying to win, winning to, to win that to, to win that exact six, yeah. six years later. So in the 52, uh, he wins. Uh, he he spent 50, yeah 52, um, six, uh, a sixth. The amount of a quarter of a million dollars that the Kennedy spent, which, by the way, we talked a little bit about Joe. Joe, again, was the money guy. It really was a lot of the family members in the background mm, that, did, that did a absolutely. lot of the, his sisters and his, his mother. We talked brothers. Brief, brothers, too. But his sisters and his mothers doing the tea, which was sort of became a bigger thing when he was running for president. But they were still kind of doing those those tea parties, I guess. Kennedy yeah. tea parties, if you will. Um with the candidates, sisters. Yeah, I, I, I think that both, both of, I would say both this campaign and Nixon's campaign really replicated um, the kind of campaigns that they were going to run uh, in the future. JFK serves as a congressman until about 52, uh, where he runs for Senate, wins, and uh, runs for president in 1960. Um, but, I mean emblematic of, of what happens in every single race um, from now until 1960. Uh, Bobby Kennedy is very much at the helm of this race uh, when uh, Joe is not. <laughs> Joe Sr. runs this race, but Bobby really does the, the legwork as it was, the, 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 the person who does the groundwork um, and gets the trains running on time, um, and it continues that way until 1960, and then he becomes Attorney General. But the the power behind JFK is no doubt uh, the family: uh, Teddy Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Eunice. Um, I mean, even his mother Rosemary. I mean, she. They. They all. This was a family affair, and this. Uh, this was uh, really how JFK ran every single race. Family was it. Family was the campaign. Family was the fundraiser. Family was uh, the surrogates. Um, and they, I think they, they, they all really rallied around him. This was, this was the Kennedy legacy, as it were. And, and they all pushed for it, and it happened. Another thing to... I like looking at this race too. Maybe not so with Nixon. I don't. Maybe maybe so with Nixon. I, I don't remember reading this much about Nixon, but um, Kennedy did take, as we said too. Kennedy was not your polished campaigner, mm -hmm. as where Nixon could get in front of a crowd and energize them. Jack was just he was just a cool guy, right? So he couldn't he could get in front of crowds, but that wasn't where his strong suit was. Jack was knocking on doors, just talking to people, you know, really pounding pavement, which Nowadays is something we wholeheartedly rely on yeah. for campaigners. It wasn't necessarily something that was done to an extent in in the early '40s. So he did a lot of that, and he had to do a lot of that in places where he wasn't 
really known yet. So um, I believe he had parts of Cambridge and Somerville in his district. He uh, had Charlestown in his district. Charlestown, uh, if you know the makeup of the land, but um, so yes, yeah, so yeah. he did have some. No, Cambridge though. Yeah, oh yeah, Somerville, Cambridge, Somerville, right. Cambridge. Yes, yeah, some, North uh, End, yeah, North End, all of it. East Boston. Um, if you don't know Charlestown at all, that that was very. They call it's a townie, right? So it, they're very into their own. Um, having myself worked on campaigns in Charlestown, uh, you've got to get to be in the click to get elected. Uh, mm -hmm. It's tough for them to pick other people. It was sort of that way back then too. Uh, but one part of Charlestown is the Navy Yard, uh, which was popular at that point. And so having been the veteran that he is, um, serving on the PT vote, uh, Jack sort of, I don't say he was welcomed in, but it, it, he was taken to a little bit better. He, he did a lot of tours and the VFWs in the area, um, and he got some townies right off the bat to sort of help him out and sort of help integrate him into that. That's something really that you only get from the sort of grassroots type politics. Um, well, it goes on to become chairman of, of the VFW actually in Boston. Oh, yeah, so... But he definitely, I definitely attribute a lot of his success to being it, to that work ethic. You know, we you, we told you earlier about him passing out during the parade bef right before the election, and there was there were multiple stories of, of situations like that where he worked his tail off, uh, knocking on doors and, and, and meeting people, mm -hmm. uh, which really helped him in this situation where you know the North End is not an Irish neighborhood, if you don't know the, the city well. Uh, that's somewhere where he, someone like Russo, would do a little bit better. It's a very mm -hmm. Italian neighborhood. So it wasn't a Kennedy stronghold. So they relied on on places like Charlestown and being able to integrate themselves, or being able to integrate Jack like they did. Yeah. So uh, just to give you a high, couple highlights, um, his campaign platform back in 1946, um, Three main things, four main things, really. Uh, housing, long-term uh, housing for homeless, immediate housing for veterans. I mean, this was huge of, of the 1946-48 elections. You have tons of veterans coming home. You have huge amounts of veteran housing being built across. I mean, here in Massachusetts, uh, it, was, it was whole neighborhoods were built um, just for veteran housing. Uh, when they came home from the war. Um, you had uh, national health care, adequate care for all, um, labor, living wage, good working conditions, and responsible working hours, and of course foreign policy, which takes a much bigger role in the JFK presidency um, that in 1960, 61, uh, 62. Uh, but foreign policy, avoid war at all costs, and strengthen the UN. Um, that was the core platform of the JFK campaign, um, which you can very much see um, in practice when he's a congressman, uh, when he's a senator, and of course when he is president. Part of the election success too, we were talking about Charlestown. Uh, he, one of the events he goes to um, was is a Gold Star Gold Star Mothers event. Um, that's it's pretty well documented. Um, he goes in, speaks, no notes, and halfway through his prepared speech, he realizes that he's not really captivating the crowd much, and so he kind of relates it back to himself and says, you know, I, I know, pretty much I know how you all feel. My mother herself is a gold star mother, um, relating back to the fact that his brother passed away, and it sort of it struck the crowd. A lot of mothers were able to relate to that, mm -hmm. and it didn't help that you know Kennedy wasn't too bad on the eyes either. So yeah. a lot of the women well, he was very awkward, quickly awkward looking. He was person. awkward, but he you know he he was very they um, commonly had the issue that he he, was, he looked yellow, and they blamed it on malaria. So when he was overseas, he had malaria, which wasn't true. But they, they but they that's what they said, and that was sort of like an oh malaria. <laughs> Which we later find out is Addison's disease, but yeah. they weren't really. I don't think they didn't know that at that point. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think that, uh, like we said, th this race was uh, a, a kickoff for a presidential election. It was a kickoff for really the, the what becomes the Kennedy legacy in Camelot. Um, 
and emblemizes the the Kennedy family, especially here in Massachusetts. I mean, Gary and I are both Massachusetts boys, so I mean, we 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 took a class in college called Kennedy politics, uh, and it really uh, I think that the love and romanticism of the Kennedy name in Massachusetts has been pretty pervasive, and so I think we've grown up learning about this man and and who he was. Um, but I think that nationwide, I mean, his popularity is still high 60s, low 70s. So I think in thinking about it, too, if you listen to the last podcast, I think the biggest contrast between this and, and the, the former one, uh, the one with Nixon, is the difference between Massachusetts and California at that point in time. Mm-hmm. All the research I've done on this race, everything I, I've learned from studying it on my own years ago up until preparing for this podcast is – no talk of communism nope. at all uh, out in Massachusetts in 1946. As where, if you listen to our previous podcast, you find that the communism, scare. the Red Scare, was taking a huge hold of California in the Hollywood area, the L.A. area at that point in time. Um, nothing really talked about about this. Mm. You know, it's still a very, we're still a very democratic state at this point in time. Um, we're, we're a Republican state becoming democratic. becoming a democratic state at this point in time. So. Uh, is where California is turning away from the Democrats at this point in time. Massachusetts isn't. So you don't really hear about it. I don't remember seeing anything or reading anything about the Red uh, Scare or he, communism, particularly pertaining to this race yeah, at he, all. Yeah, he does talk about briefly, I mean, he talks about um, we can't allow the Soviet Union to become uh, a superpower and influence and stuff like that. But nothing like uh, the communists are coming to get you by the way, my opponent's a communist. I mean, we said, like we said, the, this race was in the Democratic primary, which at the time had uh, quite a few communist sympathizers in it. Um, this, this, the AFL-CIO, well, what, precursor to the AFL-CIO, CIO and AFL, um, the they were uh, had communist sympathizers. They had communists. I mean, it was just labor unions were uh, the place for that because of the the ideology that you followed, as it were. So this was not the place or time um, to attack. Um, he didn't have to either. I mean, that that's the one thing I think that Nixon didn't play up as much, is that I went and fought um, in World War II and I was war hero, as it were, because Nixon really never had that one event that got him to be on the forefront of the newspaper. JFK was in war. He was a PT boat uh, commander. His boat got blown up and he survived with some of his crew. Um, So that was a very different um, image, as it were. Uh, Nixon was more emblematic of that average veteran coming back with a young family and uh, the hope for a new America, as it were. And JFK, single 29-year-old war veteran, um, hero is a very different image, and I think that it got him a lot further um, than Nixon. And he needed Nixon had an uphill battle versus an incumbent where JFK was running for an open seat. So it's a very different race uh, with very different outcomes. So that's projecting now. Yeah, yeah, projecting out to to where that will go, and maybe someday we do get to talk about that, but. Uh, coming up, we have a, a couple, well, we have several more podcasts, but the next, not really a two part, but the next two elections, we're going to jump ahead about 40 years and we'll be, we'll be taking in the eighties and we'll be covering a congressional race in 1984 mm-hmm. and then a senatorial race in 1988. Um, so we're looking forward to being able to talk about those again. Uh, not sure who's out there. Listening, we hope there's a lot of you out there listening. Um, but uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, via our Facebook group um, or through our website. Uh, you'll be able to let us know what you think. If there's any place you want us to go, anything more you want to talk about, any suggestions, any tips, we'd love them. Um, so f- again, feel free to any fact checks. Fact checks, yeah. If we're doing, I guess we're gonna say if we get anything yeah. wrong, please let us know. Tell us. Um, and. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep this going, hopefully, and feel free to subscribe mm-hmm. to it on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Buzzsprout. Um, like our page. Like our page, share the page, comment, let us know if you're out there. Uh, and we are, um, again, 
I want to thank Chris Matthews for writing Kennedy and Nixon, which I used heavily in the pre preparation for these last two races. Um, and last two races, last two podcasts. Mm. And um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we've used multiple public sources as well. I mean, NPR, Washington Post, uh, the uh, New York Times. I mean, we've used several uh, publications. C-SPAN is, I don't know, if we're, we're political nerds as it were, but if you like C-SPAN, please watch C-SPAN. There's a, there is so much in the C-SPAN archive. Uh, it's not even funny, but uh, PBS, um, public broadcasting, all this. Uh, so the next two races, Gary did mention, we do skip ahead about 40 years. Um, the the next podcast that we will talk about specifically uh, is Mitch McConnell's first race. Very very relevant character in American politics nowadays. Uh, but the question is, how did he get there? Uh, and I think that's what we want to answer for you. So uh, that would be the next podcast, the one coming after this one. Um, and the one after that, just to give you a little bit of a uh, forward looking to what to look forward to, is uh, the podcast we'll be doing on Bernie Sanders uh, first race for Congress, actually. Um, so uh, we've actually talked about winners uh, every single time. Uh, we talked about uh, Sarah Palin winning her governor's race. We talked about Joe Biden winning his uh, winning his uh, senatorial race, and uh, of course uh, the Nixon Kennedy. Uh, but those were our Next couple uh, would be the uh, Mitch McConnell uh, race for Senate, his first ever, um, and then uh, the race in 1988, I think it was, um, Bernie Sanders' uh, first race for Congress, um, which he actually loses. Um, but as we all know, Bernie Sanders goes on to become... Uh, well, way to give it away, Jim. Jesus. <laughs> well, I, I hope people know who Bernie Sanders is. But Mitch McConnell... They could have thought he won this, though. That's true. That is true. Um, so it, this is uh, this will be our first loss that we actually talk about. We, we've only talked about winners. Um, but you have to talk about where they come from. And this, so this is, uh, in the history of the candidates, this is one of those that, um, not a winner, but uh, shapes the rest of the races, as it were. So uh, we look forward to you uh, listening in um, next week, our the week after, whenever we do get to, to put these up. Uh, and thank you guys for listening. We really do appreciate it. Um, and uh, we hope you listen more. So, again, thank you very much. I'm Jim Blatchford. This is Gary Mannion. And uh, this is The Race.